I used to read a comic book at school called 2000 AD and it had a character in it called Tharg who had a kind of mind stone in his forehead. He was a powerful godlike figure who controlled the universe. When I came along and started making art, I was like, I wanted to change the world. Every artwork that's ever interested me is about death. I thought, what's the maximum you could pit against death? And then, you know, diamonds came to my mind. Uh, he ended up approaching Bentley and Skinner to make it for me, and they have uh, an appointment to the Queen. Wow. Oh, mm. That's the way it's all. Is it kind of held together? I see. It is, but it's just pinned and glued, so be careful. So don't go straight it around. I love it. I got the skull from uh, a shop called Get Stuffed in uh, Islington. It was quite hard to find a skull that actually just said, I'm a skull, and not said anything else. Because we're dealing with death, which is so negative, it has to be totally positive, and you can't cut corners, and it's just got to be, you know, ridiculous in its, um, in its perfection. We took the original skull, removed the teeth, had the teeth cleaned up by a dentist, and cast the whole skull in platinum. The idea for titling it For the Love of God came from my mother, who used to say that whenever I had crazy ideas. For the love of God, what are you going to do next? But I had no idea really what it would look like or how it would be perceived, and I had a big fear that it was going to end up like, you know, some sort of tacky piece of jewellery. But it has a kind of quietness and a kind of sort of transcendent feel to it. You know, it's sort of mesmerising and optimistic. That's the really shocking thing for me because it's like such a sort of negative subject that I really thought it would be dark, but it isn't at all. It has to be ultimate perfection. When I actually saw it, when it was finished, I just thought, wow. Uh, my name's Anne Gallagher, and I'm curator of this Damien Hurst exhibition at Tate. We're about four weeks into the installation. It's a really complicated installation, so there's a lot of work to be done. And we've got about a week and a week or so to go, but we're going to walk round, just talk about the pieces that are up, and explain the chronology of the the way the show runs through. I was saying that in here, there's a. Um Lots of things that I'm embarrassed about. <laughs> <laughs> or things that I probably didn't want to put in, but then... But they're important to show what follows. Yeah, like... you and Nick talked me into it, really. Yeah. I completely hated them when I made them. But then I think, looking back, they do sort of make sense to the spot paintings, which I never really made that connection exactly. before. It was like the same colours in the pans or in the butterfly paintings, in yeah. and out of love, or... You know, what it does, you know, bright, happy colours, continually. And then, with Dead Head, which is like you when you're 16. Wow, we've got a lot in this room, haven't we? I know. I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, that was a photograph in the mortuary. In the, not in the mortuary, it was in anatomy the anatomy part. school, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't really an artwork, it was just a photograph, but then I made it into an artwork when I started getting a bit of a reputation for being the, de the death guy. It seems smaller to me now. Really? Mm, it's weird. Yeah, nasty piece. Yeah. 
there's just a desire to make art that was more real and about something important. You know, I kept thinking, I love minimal art, but I kept thinking it's not about anything and it sort of, you know, kept frustrating me. So in a way the cabinets worked like a box to protect things, so I took that a bit further and just, you know, I just thought I'm going to, I'm going to own this space or something, you know. And to, you know, in a way it was to, you know, you wanted to pull people in but then keep them out at the same time. Yeah. I always just thought, you know, you should never let lack of money get in the way of an idea or, of, you know, something like that. And then, obviously, when I was a kid, I'd seen Jaws. I thought, why can't we do a big shark? But that, I, mean, yeah. I just immediately thought it's got to be big enough to eat you, and then in a volume of liquid that would be big enough to frighten you. Because the fear of a, you know, I remember walking through a Richard Serra at the Sartre Gallery and just thinking halfway through, God, this could fall on me and kill yeah. me. And sort of having a physical, being yeah, physically actually. frightened of a sculpture. You know, the fear of these sharks is an unreasonable fear, but it's a good way to kind of tap into that fear of death, which is probably a reasonable fear. And large volumes of water are quite frightening, yeah. anyway, in their own right. And what did you think when you finally saw it? Was it the effect you wanted to achieve? Yeah, it was like... It's like the Jaws music. So the acquired inability to escape, was that the first work that you made using cigarettes? Um, yeah, I think it probably was. And then afterwards came the rows of stubbed out... Yeah, I got asked in an interview recently where they said to me, um, you said in an interview, because I don't smoke anymore, they said you don't, you once said you don't trust people who don't smoke. Did you what, say that? Yeah, I did in an interview, yeah. And they said, what do you say now? And I said, I don't trust people who do. Do you still smoke? Yes. Yeah. I'd love you, really. <laughs> so, wow. in and out of love. If you can see people as flies, you can see them as butterflies as well. So I thought I've got to go the other way, like I was saying, where you know you kind of say, well, butterflies are beautiful as well. But then it's not beautiful if you look closely, because it's like it's not beautiful for the insects. It's yeah. getting trapped in the paint. Yeah, because you know. there is that horror that they're actually. Yeah, so I remember when I, I painted dead. the edges of them in there, trying to make them look like they'd struggled and flapped about and just got stuck. And then the live room, the live butterflies. I mean, yeah. when I first saw that, thinking, what is he doing? Creating this environment with butterflies flying around yeah. and actually hatching out of canvases. I, don't, I still don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Originally, I bred butterflies in my bedroom at the time, so I was like, you know, hatching them all out, and I tried to learn all about it. Yeah, I mean, I think when we started redoing it, I was a bit worried, because I thought maybe I'd, you know, because you know you kind of romanticise things from the past, and I haven't seen it for so long, I thought maybe it was just like walking around stepping on butterflies, and it was all an illusion, and it never really works, and didn't look good, but it's great to see it back together with the butterflies flying around and happy. So nice to go in there, but then so nice to get out. Yeah. Oh, they look great. Oh, fantastic. You know, with the pharmacy installation, I wanted to get a pharmacy and put it into an art gallery, but one way you actually think you are in a, you know, in a pharmacy. And then, you know, just to conf not, not even confuse you, just make you quite, just makes you question everything. And when I originally showed it, when people went into the gallery, they kind of came in and then thought they were on their, in their pharmacy, so they got back in the elevator and everybody got stuck in the elevators and kept coming in and saying, where's the art? Because it was in the gallery on... Yeah, but I love art that does that. Floor. I love art that kind of confused you or made you not sure, or, you know, you couldn't, you know, you didn't know where the art was, but in a humorous way rather than a kind of heavy way, you know? Yeah. Amazing, because they're paints, they're household paints, but there's... Uh, I think they're really good they now. They look really fresh. I, I used to be depressed when they stopped because they, they're great making them, great fun making them. And then when it stops, they're the great. And then you kind of love it for a few weeks. And then you sort of know it. And it's like you just want to make another one. So if but you've got the thought, motion into it. Yeah, but I remember thinking about that motion as well and thinking it's the motion of the planet, it's the motion of the atoms in our bodies. It's, you know, you know it's that circular motion of everything. And we're going to show them in this room with living in a world of desire. Loving in a world of desire. Loving in a world of desire. Although living in a world of desire is a good title <laughs> as well. I could have done two. You could too. Could living in a world of desire. Yeah, it's going to be quite crowded this room, but fun. It's, yeah, and a different pace, completely Kids different. Kids will love it. <laughs> and then we go back into the main room.
when I first did the first spot paintings, I, I, I did it as a, an endless series. And then I thought I should name them after drugs. And I got a book of drugs. I thought I made every book, every drug under the sun, every drug known to man for every painting. So it became this endless, infinite series. And I loved that idea conceptually. I actually thought I'll start an endless series, but I'll stop somewhere. And, you know, but then I just keep coming up with other ideas where, like, you know, this is a huge one. And it looks, you know, it's totally different to one with four spots. So actually the, you know, the difference in the paintings was so great that I just kept making them. And then coming up with another idea and making another. Mother and Child Divided, but that was the first piece where you cut the animals in half. So you see the internal organs as well as yeah. the, the, the hide or the skin. But I love that inside outside, where you get to see the inside and the outside. So it's kind of, it's whole, but you know, it's dead. And were you consciously um, alluding to Christianity when you talked about the title as being My Mother I mean, and Child? God, I mean, Christianity, I don't know about it. It's like... Subconsciously? Well, I mean, I was brought up to a Catholic, to a Catholic, as a Catholic till I was 12, so it's like all that stuff goes in there, but, you know, it's quite difficult, I think, to... I mean, I wasn't directly, but, I mean, I love, you know, I, mean, I love stories from anywhere. So, you know, I wanted to sort of play with the viewers, so if somebody says to me, is that religious, I'd be saying, well, what do you think? Yeah. Okay. Belief's a great thing to play with. Will you suggest a range of belief systems, like science, Yeah, I mean, I think... Like, yeah, so, I mean, you know, I did this, I did this, this series called... of uh, prints called New Religion, yeah. which were very scientific, and I think, you know... Science is a new religion, really. Yeah. Well, after I'd done pharmacy, I was kind of hijacking everything from all walks scientific, of scientific world. Yeah. So you moved from that um, white coated wooden cabinet that you used in the medicine cabinets and then in pharmacy into these more really polished stainless steel. Clinical yeah, looking. Sort of clinical, but they have that fear again as well. You know, the same sort of fear you get in the shark thing you get from these, because yeah. it's like, you know... Well, the instruments... Look we're all afraid of uh, surgical instruments. But why are we... Um, why do we feel kind of comforted by medicine, and yet surgery makes us terrified, in that they're both supposed to help cure you? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's a kind of invasive procedure, isn't it, exactly. surgery? I found an old Victorian tea tray, which had the base of it under glass. They'd kind of, you know, somebody in Victorian times had put butterflies in it. And, you know, it just looked great. And I thought, wow, if you did those big, they're like kaleidoscopes. And kaleidoscopes are amazing, isn't yeah. it? So. And then when it started looking like stained glass windows, I did this one, which is like the first one called Doorways to the Kingdom of Heaven, where I did them actually the like stained shape. glass windows. I remember reading that somewhere in an article, and there was like, they were saying that flagellation is one of the doorways to the kingdom of heaven, or wow. prayer is another one, and they were wow. like all these things. So the flies that are buzzing around in a thousand years, here you harness them and they adhere to the canvas. It, yeah. It's like a tradition of the monochrome, a black painting. From a distance, you just think it's a black monochrome. It looks like tar or paint. Or yeah. And then really, it's not until you get to about here that you realise it's flies. And when you're that close, and you realise it's flies, it's yeah. pretty scary. Yeah. Because you just think, you know, it's a lot of death. And then we're going to walk into the room that's yeah. bringing together the work that was made at the time of Sotheby's auction. So you created this wallpaper specifically for this room, but it's based on the catalogue? Yeah, I made this wallpaper from the inside of the catalogues. And the kingdom was one of the two pieces in the sale that had a special little booklet for itself. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the yeah. key pieces from the sale. And it's another shark, something yeah. that you, you made very early on, and then two, 2008 you returned to it. And everything in the sale, in a way, is a kind of return. Yeah, well, I made everything in that. Yeah, I wanted everything in the sale to be 2008 and just have, like, this big, huge, you know... It was kind of like an event, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, so this room, the final room, which has got the incomplete truth in it. Yeah, so very religious. I think I've become a religious artist, haven't I? <laughs> Although I deny it all the time. But when you use this title, The Incomplete Truth, what were you suggesting? I mean, I've always loved those statements. The never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think when you, when you attach that to religion, it has a lot of resonance. But the symbol of the dove is like, it's both 
a secular symbol of peace. Yeah, well, you look at it, it looks like a dove flying in the sky, but it's actually a dove trapped yeah. in liquid. So yeah. it's like it has hope, but it doesn't have hope. But, but the art, art can give us hope, I think, but yeah. religion can't. But you like all these works that say one thing and then deny it at the same time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there are answers. I think there are only questions. And I think it's, you know, for viewers to decide what the answers are. Yeah.